1 Corinthians 13. Um, I started on this last Sunday morning. And um, you pray, pray for this. Pray for the message this morning. Um, I don't want to preach it. I don't want to preach it. So pray that I can get out of it somehow. Because I don't, I'm not kidding you, I don't want to preach it. Uh, it's going to be, it's going probably going to make somebody a little upset. So it's one of those. And I don't like doing it. So, but if you'll hang on to the Bible and you'll hang on to the Lord, it'll help you. All right. First Corinthians 13. I'm just one of these that believes when, when God saves you, um, you're going to fight a battle in your flesh. You're going to fight, and you're going to fight it for a long time. You're going to fight it for probably the rest of your life. Um, but it's a battle worth fighting. When you think about what God has prepared for us and the blessing that he gives, that he promises to us, and what he's going to do for us in glory. Um, it'll make everything that you go through down here worth it. Just the hope that we have waiting for us. Uh, and I know hope is easy to give up on. But remember what the Bible says about Abraham. The Bible says, who against hope, believed in hope, staggered not at the promise of God. And so just hang on to hope, all right? Hang on to hope of, of a better day because it will come, and I promise you that. So that's sort of the, the basis of what I uh, started on last week was as dealing with the Bible issue, uh, but it also is a, is a much bigger issue as well. He said in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, he said, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, I started covering that last Sunday and sort of gave you my idea of that was that in the early church, they, they uh, were prophesying, they were speaking in tongues back in those days, and they were known languages. They just weren't known by the people who were speaking them, but it was for a reason. It was God speaking His Word in the Gentile languages so that people besides the Jews could hear the wonderful works of God. So that was being done. If you remember, uh, I think it, I can't, I can't, Cornelius' house. Cornelius was uh, the Jew, or excuse me, the Gentile that Peter had a vision of and he went to. Cornelius also had a vision of Peter coming to his house. And so God had worked that out to where when Peter showed up at the door, Cornelius opens the door and looks at him and says, I've been expecting you. Come on in. And it was there that God really for the first time saved a Gentile family. And when the Holy Ghost fell upon them, they all began to speak in these languages that Gentiles spoke. And Peter talked about that in Acts chapter 15 because there was the question of should the Gentiles be circumcised like the Jews were, should they keep the law? Should they have to keep the Old Testament customs, the Old Testament traditions, the Old Testament law, the feast days, and so on? And Peter stood up and then said, I was there. I was in Cornelius' house. The Holy Ghost fell on them like he did with us on the day of Pentecost. They spoke in all these tongues. So that was the manifestation right there. I know it happened. I was there and I know they're all Gentiles. I was with them. And he said, so I don't think that you know, James, it was James that stood up in Acts 15 and he said, Brethren, we're Jews. We didn't keep the law. We never have. That's the dirty little secret among Jews. We don't really keep the law like we make everybody think we do. So why should we, should, why we, should we put the same thing on the Gentiles that we ourselves have not done? And so they all agreed. And by the way, there was no Pope in that meeting. There was no one man who who said, I'm speaking for God here and this is what it's going to be. It was a unanimous decision by the apostles, the bishops, the elders. God had moved in all of them to consent and agree 
that the Gentiles are the Gentiles and God's going to save them the way he saved us. And, and they, God did not give them the law. And so why should we make them keep the law in order to be saved? And so um, anyway, that was that was the idea was they were speaking in these Gentile languages. So, but that was only for a time. So that's what he says in verse nine. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. So. One man would prophesy one thing from God. Another man would prophesy another thing from God. But then, right after John receives the book of Revelation, he sends the letters out to the seven churches the way Christ told him to. He's writing down everything that God is showing him. And he has it now in written form. At some point, there began to be a compiling of all of those books that the early church knew we're from the Holy Ghost. So we have the four Gospels. We have Luke writing the book of Acts. We have the 14 epistles, the Apostle Paul. We have Peter's two books. We have James epistle. We have Jude. And then we have the letters of John and the book of Revelation. And at some point, they were all... that God just directed His church to know what books were part of the scriptures and what part was not. They, they, there's a several, several books that were written back then and letters and different things, different gospels that were rejected. There is a gospel with Peter's name on it, the gospel of Peter. But it is, it is known that Peter did not write a gospel. What happened was somebody wrote an alleged life of Christ and put Peter's name on it so it would be accepted. But the Holy Ghost allowed the church to see that that was not... There's even a gospel according to Judas Iscariot. One copy was found partially corrupted, buried in the sand back, I don't know how many years ago. They pulled this thing out course they knew that Judas did but and here's the story behind the gospel of Judas this is how they know that Judas didn't there was no such thing somebody wrote it out and said it like this that Judas and Jesus were working together and that Jesus went to Judas and said I want you we're going to play a game of good cop bad cop here will you be the, the bad cop so I can be the good cop Judas said Lord whatever you want that's what I'll do so the whole, the idea was that this whole thing about Judas betraying Jesus was a setup. And it was a setup to make Jesus look good. And that Jesus then imparted this secret doctrine to Judas that he did not give to any of the other disciples or the apostles. Okay? And it's a fake, it's a phony, it's, you know, and part, like I say, part of it has been corrupted. But anyway, so you had books like that floating around. And at some point, all of the churches now are in agreement as to what we call the canon of the New Testament. And those are compiled together and they're being dispersed to churches. And then at some point, somewhere around A.D. 150, uh, they start translating those into the languages of the day, like the early Italian version, the Italic version it's called. Uh, the, uh, Ulfi, a man by the name of Ulfilus, who is translating the New Testament into the Gothic language, so that his people can, have the, can know the Gospels and know the writings of Paul, know the doctrines. So he's translating those, and we have, we have copies of that. So at some point then, God starts doing away with the prophecies, the tongues, because those are in part. Now that which is perfect has come, has been established, then those things which are in part are done away with. And then look at what Paul said, or, yeah, Paul said in verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And he's applying this same idea to... What's done in part now will be done perfectly later. He's applying the same idea to even our knowledge. I don't know everything that's in the Bible. I can't recall and remember everything from scriptures that I've read. I'd like to be able to. I, my mind just doesn't work that way. 
I've forgotten more things than I've learned. But one of these days, we're going to know everything. We're going to know the whole Bible. We'll have it in our hearts. It'll be written, it'll be written there by God himself. We won't be carrying around a Bible and we won't even be in this body. So when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is done away with. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then we're going to be able to, the Bible says, all through the Bible, we cannot see the face of God. It'll kill us. We're humans. It'll, we're just mortal flesh. There's no way. It'll blow us up. But at the end of the book of Revelation, the Bible says, and they shall see his face. We'll be able to see God's face. And live to tell about it. So, but then face to face. Now I know a part, in part. But then, then shall I know even as I also am known. So I was establishing this idea that all throughout the Bible. You see how God, when God does something the first time, it's good. But when God does something the second time, it's perfect. So you see that in Job. Job's beginning was not near as good as his ending. Same thing with Ruth. Same thing with in, in Haggai. I don't think I got this far. In Haggai chapter 2. Look at what God promised. He said, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. Now let me explain something. When Solomon built the temple, it's a magnificent temple, gold everywhere in this temple. It's absolutely amazing. There isn't a building anywhere in the world like it. And when they set the Ark of the Covenant inside the most holy place, they kept the, the rods that they carried it with, the shoulder rods, they kept it sticking out through the curtain so they'd know the Ark was in there. And when Solomon prayed his dedication, the Bible says that the, the wind blew and God's presence, the cloud filled the, te the temple so much that the Levite priest had to leave the house of God because of the glory of God that was in there. It said it was just absolutely amazing God showing up in that temple. But then he said the glory, but that temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and his army. All the furniture stolen, taken out of it, carried off into Babylon. So when the Jews come back, there's, there, God promised him rebuild this temple. And he said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. Now, here's the problem. When they built this second temple, they don't have the table of showbread. It's missing. They don't have the menorah, the seven candles. It's missing. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. It's missing. The Ark of the Covenant and the Table of Showbread and Menorah were the furniture that was crucial to the, even building the temple to begin with. So they built this temple and now you could, it could be said that because Jesus himself visited this temple, it could be said then the glory was better. But still, if you remember, when Christ died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil was rent in twain. And it, what it did was it exposed this empty room, which was, would be the most holy place. It was empty. There was no ark there. It was empty. I sound like I'm going through puberty again. <laughs> it was empty. Sound like, who was that kid on My Three Sons? It had the voice change. Chip or whatever it was. Anyway. So it was, there was nothing there. And that temple's vanished away. So my theory is the glory of the latter house, the latter house he's referring to hasn't been built yet. My idea is that Christ, when he comes again and establishes his kingdom, he's going to build his own house. Because God does not dwell in temples made with hands, the Bible says. And Jesus is God and so I have it in my mind that Jesus is going to build his own temple. And it will truly be the most glorious structure that's ever existed in earth history. Truly, the glory of this latter house. Now think of your body being the temple. Okay, your body is the temple of God, right? So apply that to this passage. The glory of my second body is going to be greater 
than the glory that's in this body. And this body in every cell and in every bone is the temple of God. I've taught on that many times. It shows you just how your body literally is the temple of God. It was designed that way. But this body is going to pass away just like the first temple did. The second body that we get will never pass away. And we use that phrase, pass away, to describe. By the way, a dear man of God that I've known most of my life, Brother Charlie Miller, passed away last night. 92 years, died on his birthday. It was his birthday yesterday, and he died sometime in the night last night. Okay? So his, apparently his birth certificate had an expiration date. It was the same day he was born. You know, 72 years or 92 years later, he's gone. But he's in heaven right now. He's got his new body. And that body is not going to ever pass away. You don't have to worry about it anymore. I'll never forget the first time I met Charlie Miller and shook his hand. I noticed that his arm did not, his arms had no hair on them whatsoever, Chris. Didn't have a lick of hair on him. And I'm going, that's odd. He was full bleed Cherokee Indian. Okay. And I just, I, I just, just what I remember about him. He was a great guy, but that's what I remember about him. Okay. Uh, Exodus 4. When God is taking Moses through the signs that he's going to do in Egypt. And he tells Moses, he says, stick your hand in your bosom and then pluck it out. When he plucked it out, it was full of leprosy, white as snow. Well, it's a picture of Christ. Christ came in John chapter 1. He said the son was in the bosom of the father. Christ comes from the bosom of the father down here to earth. And on him is laid the sins of the entire world. That's what leprosy is a picture of. It was white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. So what he said, pluck your hand in again to your bosom. So then Christ goes back up to the bosom of the father. He's at the right hand of the father. And he says, pluck it out again. And when he plucks it out again, his skin is clean. Because the Bible says when Christ comes the second time, the second time he'll be coming without sin and to judge the earth. So he says to Moses, tell the Israel, he said, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. So if you pull it out once and there's leprosy on it and Israel doesn't believe that one, when you pull it out again and it's clean, they'll believe the second sign. And I like that because what that's saying is, that first coming of Christ, Israel did not believe that that was their Messiah. So they did not believe the first sign. When he comes again, they're going to believe the voice of the latter sign. And they're going to believe that that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. They're going to know it. They're going to believe it. Apply that to the two testaments that you have in your Bible. In fact, turn to, um, let's see if I can find this. I think it's 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, maybe. Somewhere around in there. It could be. Is it? No. Is it in 2 Corinthians 6? Somewhere in there. I can't remember where it is, but. Yeah, yeah, here we go. 2 Corinthians. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 3. Look at there. Thank you, Lord, for letting me find it. Look at verse 6. Who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter is the letter of the law in the Old Testament. And the law kills you. How does the law kill you? The law condemns you because you violated the law. And God sticks to the letter of the law in the Old Testament and its condemnation. But the New Testament has breath in it has spirit in it so we're ministers not of the old testament because none of us are of the tribe of levi but we're of a new tribe a spiritual tribe we are spiritual priests unto god giving spiritual sacrifices so verse 7 look at verse 7 but if the ministration of death written and graven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. What he's talking about was when Moses comes down, this wouldn't really, they didn't really put this special effect in Charlton Heston's movie. But when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the, of the Testament in his hand, his face is shining so bright, the Jews cannot look at him. I mean, it's like staring at the sun. You look at it and you glance away. You just can't do it. And they had to have Moses put a veil over his face to cover that up. So Moses, when Moses would go back in the tab tabernacle with God, he could lift the veil. 
But he would come back out. They had to have him cover his face with a veil. But eventually that died down. Eventually that faded away. And God signifying that that's what's going to happen to the law that Moses came down with. Eventually it fades away. That law or that glory was done away with. So think of, uh, think of when there's a full moon out. All you can see in the sky is the full moon and it's glorious, right? But what happens 10 o'clock the next morning? It's gone. I mean, the moon's still there, but the sun is out shining that glory of the moon. And that's the same picture that he's given here with these two testaments. Even though the Old Testament was glorious, when the New Testament showed up, you hadn't seen glory yet until you've seen the new covenant. That's what he's saying here. So he says, verse 7, the ministration of death was glorious so that the children of Israel could not behold the face of Moses. Verse 8, how shall, the, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious or more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So think about the two pictures. You have Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with his face shining. But then you have Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 with his face shining so bright it's like the sun. That's God signifying the two covenants and the two ministers of those two covenants. Moses passed away and is gone. Jesus lives on forever. All right. So, um, yeah, look at verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. What was Moses' problem? He stuttered. He, had, he was a stammerer. He had a speech impediment of some kind. Okay? So you could not plainly understand Moses. And the Jews to this day do not understand the old covenant. They don't get it. But then Paul says, now in the new covenant, we speak plainly. We say it. I mean, think about it. Jesus showed up all throughout the Old Testament, but they just didn't know it. He was the rock that followed them. There was a rock that followed the Israelites everywhere they went that water came out of it. it wasn't just one time deal. Apparently that rock followed them and that Paul said that rock was Christ. That manna that fell down from heaven every day in their camp, no matter where they were, manna fell down. Jesus said it. He said, I was that bread that came down from heaven. It was me. The lamb that they sacrificed, Jesus said, that was me. The high priest, that was Jesus. All of these places in the Old Testament where Jesus showed up, yet no one knew him as the Son of God. So now in the New Testament, he says it plainly before Abraham was, I am. He is the Son of God and he says it plainly. So now you see the difference in the Old and the New Covenant. Even though the Old is good, the second one's better. Okay, and it's the same way with your two births. Um, he says, verse 13, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that children of Israel cannot steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away as Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken of the way. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And look what he says in verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. This body is glorious. There is rejoicing when a baby is born. Matthew and Paige, you didn't know this. But when you FaceTime your mom, I was driving a car, I was bawling like a baby. I was bawling louder than she was. That baby's born, it's glorious. But when someone's born again, it's more glorious. Amen? So that's what he's teaching us here. Um, in Matthew 9, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is... Put in to fill it up, taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. It's not wineskins. You Mandela effect it people. Almost said idiots. Didn't mean to say idiots, but don't be stupid. Nobody changed the Bible. Amen? 
It's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. Nobody's changing Jesus Christ. It's a bottle. Ne neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. New wine's a spirit. New wine is a new covenant. Anything new, anything new in the Bible is a picture of the new covenant and the new body and the new birth. The new man. The new man. Why was it that God waited till Sarah was 90? Because Sarah represents the old body, but inside is a new man in there. And that man is pro the man of promise. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Somebody say amen. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're in Christ... Didn't matter what you did. Didn't matter who you used to be. Didn't, didn't ma I, watching the guy, and I don't, I don't know about his, I don't know about his Christian testimony. He says he's saved. He says he's born again. I, I guess I believe him. I don't know because I haven't studied the man much. But there's a guy that, at the time, was on the list, the top list of the richest mafia bosses in America. And he was, he was 35 years old and was in the list of the richest mob bosses in the country. Just a few behind John Gotti. 35 years old and he had money, he had everything. And he had to do some prison time, but he married this gal and she led him to the Lord. And he goes around talking about how God saved him. And he's, he's, he said, I am the luckiest man in the world because you don't leave the mafia Except you got a bullet in your head. And he said, it's by the grace of God, I'm still alive. Well, I look at that guy. If he's saved, praise the Lord. But all of that old stuff he did, that's all gone. It's passed away. Okay? And when you sit next to a guy in prison that says he's there for murder. And he says God saved him. I believe it. Because God can save the worst of the worst. Amen. Hebrews 8. For finding fault with them. He saith, Behold the days come. And saith the Lord. When I will make a new covenant. With the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah. And he said. Verse 13. A new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old. Is ready to vanish away. So the new. Is always better. Than the old. The sun's always going to be brighter than the moon. Your second birth, always better. Revelation 21, here it is. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Think about the sea, what it represents. Okay? Hey, praise the Lord! I just got a text message. Linda Toomey is out of prison. I mean, out of the nursing home. <laughs> she says, Mom says I'm out. <laughs> exclamation, exclamation point. Amen. So, yeah, she told me that she was going to be able to get to go home today. And she's at home. And yeah, amen. Praise the Lord for that. Okay. But th think about what the sea represents. Salt in the Bible is a type of burning. And God says that it shall be a salt and a burning. What happens when you get salt on grass? What does it do to the grass? Burns it. Burns it up. Okay. So what happens when you get salt on a wound? It burns. Okay. So does mercurochrome. That was my Meemaw's in her medicine cabinet. The only medicine she believed in in the world was a bottle of mercurochrome. And whenever you, if ever I got scuffed out there. Burn like gasoline. Man, that stuff burns. But anyway. So, it's this picture that God is teaching us. It, now everything's in part. Now we know in part. Brother Sterling reads his Bible and he may know something from the Bible that I don't know. But I know something he doesn't know. Some of you guys, you read the Bible and you know, you see things in there that I don't see. But I see things that you don't see. So now it's all in part. Same Bible, but everybody's got a little bit different this, a little bit different that. Even sometimes there's disagreements. I see it this way. No, I see it this way. Okay, same Bible. Okay, big deal. One of these days, it's all going to be 
whole. It's all good. Think about the body of Christ. The body of Christ consists of everybody that's ever followed God for thousands of years. Some of those are dead now. Some are alive now. Some of them haven't even been saved yet. And they're going to follow Christ. So right now, even the body is in part. But that's the purpose of the gathering. When he gathers first the dead in Christ, then he, those which are alive remain caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So now we're all going to be one as the same body in Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 3, I, I just read that. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So my thing about this, you know, do we still do we still get gifts of the Spirit? Yes. I mean, who doesn't want a word of wisdom? Who doesn't need a word of knowledge? I do. But now, instead of you getting it from some spirit, which you have to question, because the Bible says, test the spirit. And I told these pastors out in Kenya the other day, I said, you know, I believe that God still speaks to us. The Holy Ghost communes with our spirit. But we're to make sure that what we heard from the spirit, we heard from the right spirit. So God says, test those spirits to see that whether they be of God or not. I mean, there'd be things that I've thought and things I thought may have been from God. And there's even times when I mean, I got excited because I thought I had some new thing from God that, you know, God was showing me. And when I went to the scriptures, I found out that I had memorized the scripture wrong. And I was wrong in what I was thinking. The scripture never said that. I went, oh, okay. Well, I guess I can't make a video on that one then. But it would have been good, but it wouldn't have been true, so I can't do it. So anyway, that's the point behind it. Is that they spoke in tongues. They spoke, they prophesied. And there's some who still say, well, we need to speak in tongues and we need to prophesy. Have prophets stand up. One guy telling me that every church must have a house prophet who sits there and says... If the preacher's preaching and this guy says that's not from God, then we have to follow that man's authority. And there were some cases where they had a house prophetess. Yeah. And I went, uh, I don't. So that guy asked me, do you, does your church have a house prophet? I said, yes. We call him King James. He didn't like that. I said, listen, if you're trying to tell me that there's somebody supposed to sit in my church that is an authority over the word of God, you're nuts. So we, now we have it perfect. We have it perfect. And the word of God should settle all the arguments. Unfortunately, it doesn't. So I have to preach something this morning that I don't want to preach. So if I... If, if I'm in my office and I ain't coming out, you might have to come drag me out. Father in heaven, we ask for your grace, your blessings. Father, I love these people. And I'll love them till I die. And I pray, God, that you'd help them. I pray, Lord, you bless people online. Lord, what you're giving me, it may not be for anybody here. It may be for some people online, God. I'll leave that up to you. But Father, your word is your word and it's final authority on everything. And I have to say things that I don't want to say. And Father, I need your help because I get afraid. God, I've been down too many hard roads before. I got too many people mad at me. So Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just bless and, and put a good spirit in this place and put a good spirit on me. So I don't say anything in the flesh. Lord, just bless your word. Lord, I love this church. I love what you're doing. God, you did something this week that there is no way in the world that a church this size could have ever pulled anything like this off. No way. But God, you did it. And I thank you for it. 
And God, I want everybody here to be a beneficiary of the blessings of what you're doing here. So I pray, dear God, that you'd bless, you'd unite us together, you'd fill our hearts with love one for another. And just keep us, Father, in your hand. We love you and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.